Hey guys, uh, today we're talking about the GI health assessment and examination, um, so gastrointestinal. Uh, we're going to hopefully review a little bit of anatomy, but like always, make sure that you go back to your other books and other courses and review um, your A&P, your anatomy and physiology, for um, this section, especially if you need it. If it's been a while and you haven't um, looked at the food to poop tube in a while, which is how I explain it to my kids, the... Um, and then we'll look at the GI health history, the GI examination, which includes inspection, and a little bit different, remember, usually we talk about inspection than um, percussion, palpation, and auscultation, but it's a little bit different with the GI. We talk about inspection, then auscultation, then palpation and percussion. And then at the end, we'll talk about the renal examination, or the genital urinary, um, specifically just renal, because G, um, GYN, and um, we'll talk about later, but... So, um, this is a little bit oversimplified, the food to poop tube, the GI tract, right? The chomper, the masher, the extractor, the poop factory, poop collector, poop muscle, and poop chute. Um, but my son, for some reason, is fascinated with this system, so I had to do this lecture multiple times. Okay, so, um, like usually, uh, we uh, start with a little bit of um, orientation to the anatomy of the abdomen. So if you don't know this basic internal anatomy, you'll want to review this in detail. Uh, you'll need to know these internal structures in order to make sense of your physical exam findings. In the right upper quadrant here, you'll feel um, the liver, although much of it is tucked away underneath the ribs, as you can see. And you'll feel the lower margins, though. And as you can see from this picture, the gallbladder, this, that's that green structure beneath the liver border, is generally not palpable because it's too deep in the abdominal cavity. But with deep inspiration, when the patient, or when, when you're deeply palpating in that area and you have the patient take a deep breath, sometimes you can feel, um, you can feel that area, especially if it's inflamed. And you might not be able to feel it so much as if it comes down and bumps your fingers, it'll be very tender. So, We'll talk about that later. That's a sp specific maneuver. Um, sometimes you may feel the lower pole of the right kidney, uh, especially in really thin people um, with very relaxed abdominal muscles or very not very many abdominal muscles. When you move to the left upper quadrant, you'll feel the abdominal aortic pulsation at midline before moving to the left upper quadrant, which really houses the spleen, um, which is lateral and behind the stomach and just above the left kidney. This is also protected by the ribs, except for that very tip. Um, it's not palpable generally unless the spleen is enlarged. So you generally, whereas you will feel the liver um, usually, you will not feel the spleen usually unless it's enlarged. The pancreas you can see there is midline um, and in the, in the left upper quadrant, but not generally palpable. Moving down to this left lower quadrant, you can feel the firm narrow colon, the, the tubular sigmoid colon. It's in the, um, it's in um, this area here. And a lot of times it's kind of tender. It's a little bit tender in people, but um, that's, that's normal. It shouldn't be very painful though. Lower in the midline area here will be the bladder. And in thin people, you may be able to feel, um, in very thin people, you might be able to feel the bony edge of the S1 vertebra. So this vertebra, as it kind of as it kind of tucks under and into the pelvis, you might feel that vertebra. In women, you could potentially feel the uterus and the ovaries. Usually this requires a bimanual examination where you uh, have um, fingers inserted into the vaginal vault and then you're feeling anterior on the abdominal wall and interior through the vaginal vault. In the right lower quadrant down here, you'll have the loops of bowels uh, which and the appendix. Um, the appendix you shouldn't be able to feel in healthy um, and healthy people who don't have appendicitis. But that's really it. So make sure that you kind of understand these different areas, where you would feel them, and um, the structures that are there. That way you can make sense of someone who has, say, abdominal pain, right? There are a couple different ways to divide the abdomen. This is helpful for charting. This is helpful for um, relaying your findings to another provider. One way is to divide it into four quadrants here. Right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant. Another way is into nine quadrants where you have your epigastric, umbilical, and hypogastric or suprapubic regions, which is shown by this first, by this first picture. 
you'll generally start your assessment in one quadrant and then move clockwise, making sure that you assess every area. Okay, so when will you assess the system? You will assess it briefly during every, probably every exam. Um, you'll note the, you know, if someone has an obese abdomen, you might notice that, right? So that's inspection. But um, for wellness examinations, you'll do a brief GI exam. Definitely you'll do a more thorough examination when someone complains of abdominal pain, distension, gas, bloating, any bowel changes. If they have um, any symptoms of dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing, trouble eating, um, jaundice. So if you notice that their eyes are jaundice or their uh, buccal mucosa is jaundice, you'll want to take a, a look, in, uh, especially focusing on the liver. You'll, um, if patients have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, excuse me. If they have fever of unknown origin, that's what F-U-O means, um, fever of unknown origin, and a lot of other things. But the most common that you're going to see is probably abdominal pain, which is why we're going to spend a little bit of time on it. Uh, abdominal pain, the differential diagnosis is more helpful probably to go by quadrant because um, you know it's a little bit quadrant specific. So in the right upper quadrant, the most common cause of right upper quadrant pain is going to be cholecystitis because you have your that gallbladder up there, and the gallbladder is, is fairly common, um, pretty common to get inflamed uh, and have um, some problems. So cholecystitis in the left upper quadrant, poten potentially pancreatitis. Uh, that can also be epigastric burning pain, sometimes radiating to the back. Left lower quadrant, uh, consider ectopic pregnancies, salpingitis, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, nephrolithiasis, kidney stones, IBS, hernias, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, all the, you know, all the female GYN things that are down there. Same with the right lower quadrant. We often think all, everything in the right lower quadrant is appendix, right? But um, you're going to see a lot of um, other issues, mesenteric adenitis. You know, I think the first four or five appendicitis is, uh, appendicitis is that I thought were appendicitis, and I got ultrasound, I kind of worked it up acutely, um, were all, all came back as this mesenteric adenitis. Um, so that's something that um, kind of mimics appendicitis. Uh, and, um, sorry, uh, also ectopic pregnancies, salpingitis, all those female problems, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, and uh, nephrolithiasis again, because you have two, right, two kidneys, uh, hernias, the same sort of thing. And then epigastric area, think about gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, reflux, appendicitis. Appendicitis, interestingly, actually occur starts as generalized abdominal pain. I um, might have generalized or sometimes epigastric, more epigastric pain that then locates down into the right lower quadrant. So it usually starts as generalized pain or, or um, epigastric pain before it um, becomes more of the um, right lower pain. Remember to always old cart your um, abdominal pain, so your health history. You know, timing is really important. Location is really important. Um, also, look at uh, alleviating and aggravating factors such as meals and eating. How does the pain feel or how does it differ with eating? How does it differ or change with alcohol? Uh, medications, you know, have they been taking NSAIDs for, you know, a, another a different unrelated problem? Like maybe they, you know, sprain their ankle or have knee pain so they've been overdoing the um, NSAIDs and that now they've given themselves some gastritis or peptic ulcer disease. Have they been overdoing antacids, so feel, uh, listen and ask for those sort of things. It's important that, um, you know, sometimes patients don't associate as needed medications uh, with their medication list. So if you ask a patient, hey, are you on any medications? They're going to think routine medications, maybe, you know, medications that, that a prescriber has prescribed for them, a clinician has prescribed. They might forget to tell you about over-the-counter things like NSAIDs or antacids. So make sure that you're specifically asking about, about those things. You can ask about stress, which is associated with peptic ulcer disease, um, gastritis, reflux, things like that. Um, body positioning, does it help if you remain in fetal position? Do you have to lay straight on your back? You know, how, what makes it feel better? What makes it feel worse? Um, and then specific associated signs and symptoms that you need to review. You need to be asking, obviously, about fever, chills, weight loss. So those are sort of your constitutional, right? And then nausea, vomiting, heartburn, 
any changes in bowel habits or bowel pattern, any diarrhea, constipation, blood in your stools, any bloating, gas, fullness, or flatulence, um, decreased appetite, get a menstrual history and a sexual history if the pain is kind of more lower ab abdominal area. Um, this is really important in females with you know right and left lower abdominal um, pain. Uh, make sure that you're getting a, asking about past medical history, specifically colorectal cancer, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, any liver problems. Uh, diabetes is in here because diabetes can cause gastroparesis, which is a delayed gastric emptying and decrease in peristalsis. So the food tends to sit in the abdomen or in the in the stomach for longer, which can cause nausea, feelings of fullness, um, things like that, vomiting sometimes. For health maintenance, you should make sure to uh, assess and see when the patient had their last colonoscopy, uh, colonoscopy uh, or their stool for occult blood, if they drink alcohol, what their immunization status is, especially, specifically hepatitis immunization. Um, and then family history, ask specifically about cancers, you know, colon, ovarian, prostate cancers, liver disease, things like that. The order of the examination here is different than all the other systems we talked about so far. So the order of examination is to inspect first, so observe or inspect first, then you auscultate, and then you percuss and palpate. And you do this because you don't want to percuss and palpate and move the abdominal contents around and then listen to it. Um, you know, if you're listening to see if there's absence of bowel sounds, you want to do that before you start messing around and, and increasing peristalsis by moving everything around. It's also better to have the patient with uh, an empty bladder so you're not making them feel like they have to urinate. Warm your hands in stethoscope. Wash the patient's face for signs of distress. Um, sometimes you'll encounter really ticklish patients and that it's hard to, um, to palpate their uh, abdomen. So if that's the case, then you can palpate with the patient's hand under yours and then have them move their hand. Uh, so you can start with the patient's hand under yours and then have them move their hand and then continue your palpation. You can inspect for pulsations, for peristalsis, for the ways of the stomach. Look for umbilical hernias, which are um, protrusions in that umbilical ring common in infants. They usually resolve in the first couple of years of life, definitely um, by two. If they're not resolved by two, then they need to be um, potentially need to be surgically corrected. But they can occur in adults as well. You can look at the skin for, stri for striae, for scars. If the patient uh, told you during your health history that they hadn't had any surgeries and then you see a, um, you know, a, a large surgical incision, then you can ask them, hey, uh, when I was, when we were talking, you said you didn't have any surgeries, but what's this scar from? You know, and they might be like, oh yeah, I had my appendix out when I was 12 or whatever. Look for um, the contour of the abdomen. Is it obese? Is it flat, rounded, protuberant, uh, scaphoid? Look for signs of you know, those protuberant abdomens may indicate ascites, pregnancy, adiposity, gas, um, and we'll talk about ascites particularly in, in a bit. Uh, the abdominal examination uh, on a little kiddo, um, again, umbilical hernias are really, really common in, in newborns. Uh, they usually resolve by the first year of life. Um, I usually try to tell parents not to do anything for them depending on um, on the parent, and sometimes it's a cultural thing, they like to reduce them and then tape, you know, a quarter or, or 50 cent pieces to the ab to the uh, um umbilical area to keep the hernia down. Um, it's not going to do them any harm unless they're reacting to the tape, but just, you know, it's better just to, to leave them alone. But here's the different areas that hernias are commonly um, associated with it. So epigastric or ventral hernias, umbilical hernias, and then you can get inguinal and femoral hernias as well. And I think we, we may talk about those now, but we might talk about those uh, when we talk about the genital um, urinary system for men. I don't know. I guess we talk about them now. Okay. So femoral hernias, um, there is a uh, a laxity in, in the femoral ring, which allows the contents to kind of go down into um, into this area. You can actually feel the bulge, um, but you can see the bulge, and sometimes you can auscultate the bulge because that's bowels, right? So if you're listening to this bulge and you hear bowel sounds, it's likely that it is um, a hernia there. This is 
uh, an inguinal hernia, which um, is a defect in the inguinal canal, the inguinal ring, and causes that herniated loop of bowel. These aren't really problematic unless they're strangulated, unless they become really tender or painful. Uh, if they're easily reducible, meaning you can kind of push them back and they go away and they kind of reduce easily, then um, yes, they may need to be repaired at some point, but it's not an emergent or a critical situation. But if this was strangulated, meaning if this had twisted on itself or if it was strangulated here, then this loop of bowel could could die, become ischemic and die, and that become um, a lot of pain, but also potentially um, septic and cause a lot of problems. We will talk about this more when we talk about the male um, genital urinary areas. Okay, after you've palpated, or I mean after you've um, inspected and observed, the next step is auscultation. This um, provides some important information about the motility of the bowel. Um, so you want to make sure you do this before palpating the abdomen because when you're palpating this can alter the frequency of bowel sounds and things. So the bowel sounds are um, transmitted all throughout the abdomen. So listening in one spot, like the right lower quadrant, is usually fine. You can usually hear bowel sounds in all those from all different quadrants in that area. If you don't hear bowel sounds, then that's where you'd want to listen over every quadrant. Um, or if the patient has pain, but for a, you know just a wellness examination, listening in one area is probably sufficient. Um, if there's pain or a reason to be doing a more detailed examination, then you might want to focus and listen uh, uh, for to each each quadrant of the abdomen. I think your book says you know listen for a full minute in each quadrant of the abdomen. Um, usually not uh, required for um, the purposes of you know wellness examinations, but. You can also listen for bruies. We talked about this in the last lecture a little bit, so you can listen to aortic and renal bruies, femoral bruies, iliac. Don't worry about it. You don't have to really listen to iliac bruies, but you could potentially. I think there's a picture coming up of where all these would be located. Um, and if you f notice a bruie, then you ha you should get the patient in, obviously, to um, uh, vascular surgery or ultrasound and um, have more workup. Um, they the bruises here sound just like a brew in, in you know the in the carotid pulse or kind of like a heart murmur that you might hear. Um, so just you can listen to those. And here's that those areas that I was talking about with the bruises. So the aortic pulsation kind of comes down here. You can kind of listen for bruises of the aorta aortic um, abdominal aorta in this area. Renal arteries off to the side. These are the first branch. You can also listen to these on the posterior aspect. If you turn the patient around, you can listen on the on the on the back. Iliac arteries are uh, down further, and then the femoral arteries are down in the um, pelvic area. You can listen for friction rubs in the hepatic and splenic um, uh, areas. So hepatic friction rubs um, and um, splenic friction rubs. They usually indicated. Um, you know, some sort of diseased um, organ, so uh, inflammation process of the liver or of the spleen. Um, and the uh, liver you know, can be due to um, any sort of inflammatory process, hepatitis, enlargement, um, things like that. You usually will hear them, though, and not you won't feel them generally. Um, percussion. Once you've um, auscultated all the abdominal contents, then you can listen or, or, um, and percuss. Um, so percussion, um, you can do this anytime that there's um, discomfort. And you can do this even on a wellness examination just to kind of get, get the feel of it down. But um, if the, the times when I do this generally are going to be associated with, um, with ascites, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But... Uh, you do this to assess the amount and the distribution of gas and fluids um, to identify potential masses or ascites. And then you can also estimate the size of the liver and the spleen based on percussion, percussing the borders, uh, which isn't super sensitive unless you do it a lot um, and you get good at it. But uh, So first start off with lightly palpating each quadrant. So uh, you first just kind of palpate to make sure there's not too much tenderness and then you can percuss. And you're you're percussing, hopefully, the sound that you want to hear is tympanic. So tympany is that 
is that hollow drum type of a sound, you know. So that's the sound that you should normally hear in most abdomens. Uh, it'll be dull when there's a mass, when there's feces, when there's an organ or, or fluid even. So uh, when the patient is laying down, the top of the abdomen should be um, gas-filled, right? should be tympanic, and then it'll get more dull on, the, on these sides over the liver and the spleen. You can percuss over the anterior chest wall between the lungs and the costal margins for the liver and the spleen. Remember, they are protected by the rib cage, so it's a little bit difficult because you have to percuss in between the ribs. Um, and in between the ribs, you have uh, intercostal muscles and some other structures, which can also kind of um, make it sound dull when maybe it's not. But you can percuss both the midclavicular lines and the midsternal line for the liver. Uh, and in the midclavicular line, the percussion should be longer, you know, it should be 6 to 12 centimeters, whereas in the midsternal line, it should be 4 to 8 centimeters, which makes sense if you remember how the, for how the liver is situated in the um, chest. So I think this picture, oh yeah, here. So here's a picture that illustrates uh, what, we're, what we were just talking about. So you percuss over the anterior chest wall between the lung and the costal margins in both the midclavicular and the midsternal lines. And here, 6 to 12 centimeters, you would expect it to be 6 to 12 centimeters. And then here underneath the um, sternum, maybe 4 to 8. Anything larger than that it can indicate uh, hepatomegaly, enlargement of the liver. But that's a pretty large range, you know, 6 to 12 centimeters and 4 to 8 centimeters. If, um, if the liver is hard, if the liver is uh, a lot smaller than that, then that can indicate a really... Um, hard, small liver, which that's usually associated with cirrhosis, you know, the apoptosis of the, um, of the liver cells, which causes that liver to become kind of hard and shriveled and, and not healthy. Um, that was liver. Okay, so then the spleen, you can assess for the splenic percussion sign. So you, you percuss the lowest inner space and the left anterior axillary line. This is normally tympanic. And then you have the patient take a deep breath and, and hold it. So take a deep breath, hold it, and then you percuss again. If it's tympanic, that means that the, 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 the spleen still hasn't come down there, right? So that's normal. If it's dull, then that could indicate some splenomegaly. And this is called a positive splenic percussion sign. But that's not, you know, sometimes you can have a positive splenic percussion sign and not have any um, uh, splenomegaly. But um, if it's not there. So if it is tympanic, then that means your spleen is definitely not enlarged though. Okay. So um, when you think a patient has ascites or fluid in their abdomen, um, they will have a fairly classic look. They usually have a protuberant abdomen and bilateral flank dullness. So both of their um, flanks, you know, their, the, uh, when they're laying flat, kind of down by their hips, will be dull. Um, and so you can do it, what we call a t test for shifting dullness. So you map out the tympanic and the dull areas when the patient is laying flat. And obviously it should be dull on each side because the fluid is down at the bottom, right? And tympanic at the top because the air is at the top. When you have the patient roll to one side, all the fluid goes to the dependent side. And then the flank that's, that's up on, uh, that's, you know, when, if you turn the patient to their left, then the right side, which is higher, uh, is now tympanic because all the fluid that was there is now down in the dependent area. So you can you can uh, test for that shifting dullness when the patient uh, moves around. And there's a picture, I think, for this. So here the patient's laying flat. This is all tympanic because this is all fl filled with fluid down here. And here's that kind of bulging flank. And it's going to be dull because there's fluid in there. When you roll them to their side, all the fluid that was up here is now down here, right? So when you're percussing, you're like dull, 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 tympanic. So you can mark this line kind of right here. So now there's dullness here, tym tympany here. And back here where there was dullness when the patient was flat is now tympanic because all there was fluid there, but now it's gone dependent. So that tells you that there's um, fluid in the abdo abdomen uh, indi indicative of ascites. Finally, after inspecting and auscultating and percussing, you can get to palpating the abdomen, which again is kind of what people you know, usually jump right to um, 
when they think about the abdominal um, the abdominal uh, examination. So you'll start with light palpation, then you'll move to deeper palpation uh, to assess the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, and the bladder. The uterus, ovaries, and adnexa are usually palpated, um, again, with the bimanual examination, and you'll learn this in the GYN lecture and then in women's health. In your women's health class, the class you'll have an opportunity to do a GYN, examine GYN um, professional patients. Um, so light palpation, use a gentle probing motion with the hands. This reassures and relaxes the patient and the abdominal contents. You'll identify any superficial organs or masses. You'll most, I mean, the, the most useful thing for, with light palpation is getting the patient used to the temperature of your hands that you're pressing on, on their abdominal contents and then looking for any guarding. Voluntary guarding is when the patient is consciously flinching when you touch him or her. Involuntary guarding is going to be those uncontrolled muscle spasms with palpation. So if you're assessing the abdominal wall and you feel that there's muscle um, palpation or muscle spasms, and that's going to be the involuntary guarding, which is a not a great sign. Usually can indicate peritonitis or um, some sort of inflammatory process. With deep palpation, you'll palpate in all quadrants. You can assess for what we call rebound tenderness, um, and you do this by slowly pressing in and deeply into a, an abdominal quadrant and asking the patient if they have any pain. Um, and then you can quickly release the pressure and ask them if the pain was worse when you were palpating, when you were pressing down, or when you released quickly. If the pain is worse when you release quickly, then that's called rebound tenderness. And that's because when you're pressing in deeply, you're slowly displacing um, uh, you know, the abdominal contents and any fluid and any um, structures that are in there. But then when you release quickly, you're kind of allowing this, this recoil, this rapid recoil of the contents, which causes a little bit more um, vibration. And uh, if the patient has any infl inflammation to the nearby structures or any, any uh, peritonitis, or, uh, then that can cause um, more pain when you let go quickly. You can deep, deeply palpate uh, for McBurney's point, which is um, on the right side of the abdomen, one-third the distance between the anterior superior iliac spine, the, which is the ASIS, the anterior hip bone, and the umbilicus, so the belly button. So if you go one-third of the distance from the anterior hip, the ASIS, to the umbilicus, this is called McBurney's point. It's the most common location of the base of the appendix where it attaches to the cecum. So this is going to be the point that is most likely um, the closest to the appendix. So if you have pain here, deep when you palpate deeply, then that could indicate some uh, an inflammation to the appendix or to the mesentery surrounding the appendix, which was what always kind of fooled me when I was uh, a young clinician. Um, so uh, when you're palpating the liver, it takes a lot of practice. So we will practice this in lab, um, but you'll ask the patient to lay flat. So the patient should be laying down. You can see here that the clinician's non-dominant hand is behind the patient's back, and their dominant hand is on their abdomen. And you're um, pressing underneath the right costal margin. Um, so you're pressing not only down in the abdomen, but also kind of up anterior. Uh, to get your fingers kind of underneath this costal margin here in order to fill the liver border. You can ask the patient to take a deep breath while you're palpating, and that forces, you know, as the diaphragm lowers, that forces down the abdominal contents, and the liver can kind of come down a little bit, and you might feel the border a little bit better. If there's um, some increased musculature or some obesity or extra tissue, you can do what's called a hooking technique and where you use both your hands on the right quadrant and you stand up by the patient's shoulder uh, and then you're hooking your fingers underneath those costal margins and you're hooking your fingers up to feel the liver and you can again ask them to take a deep breath and that can bring the liver contents down. With spleen palpation it's similar the non-dominant hand is in the back supporting kind of pressing up while the dominant hand is pressing down in the abdominal contents. So you press deeply at the left costal margin it shouldn't, the, the spleen should not be palpable. 
even with deep inspiration. If it is, if, the, if you feel the splenic tip, and then it can indicate splenomegaly. Uh, maybe they had an illness recently. Maybe they have mono, you know, any of those sort of things. But um, if if the spleen is enlarged, then they shouldn't be, you know, we always worry about splenic enlargement because we don't want spleens to rupture. So um, sports, you know, if the spleen isn't completely um, encased in the, in the uh, protected by the ribs, then it's at risk and spleen, spleens can bleed like crazy. So you don't want to get a, spl a spleen laceration. Murphy's sign. Um, this is a special technique that you can do that assesses for cholecystitis or inflamed gallbladder. You uh, palpate deeply in the right upper quadrant, hooking your fingers beneath the costal margins and asking the patient to take a deep breath. So very similar to your assessment of the liver. So you kind of do the exact same thing as you would if you were assessing for the liver. But then as you have the patient take a deep breath, if the patient feels pain or they have a cessation of inspiration. So a positive Murphy's is not only pain in that area, it's usually pain and a cessation of inspiration. So as they're taking a deep breath, they stop, you know, and say, ow, ow, that hurts. Because as you're taking deep breath, the abdominal contents move down, shift downwards. So the liver and the gallbladder become a little bit more palpable um, or able to be palpated. And... Um, if you bump that area, then it's really tender and inflamed, um, then that's indicative of cholecystitis. So a positive Murphy's sign is, um, is concerning for cholecystitis or gallbladder problems. You can test for fluid waves. This is when you suspect someone has ascites. I generally just percuss the abdomen for ascites, but you can also test for the fluid waves. So um, it's easier if we show a picture here. So you have the patient or someone else um, hold the, the, the abdominal wall contents um, by putting their fingers here and here. And then with the clinician, as if you're the clinician, then you put one hand on each side of the abdomen. And with one hand, you're, you're briskly pushing uh, quickly. And then you're feeling to see if that wave travels and comes and hits your hand over on this side. And that's called a fluid wave, where you can feel the fluid from this side come over and hit your fingers on this side, and you can do it the other way as well. Rovzing sign is a, is a test um, for suspected appendicitis or peritonitis, and you can press deeply and evenly in the lower quadrant and then quickly withdraw your fingers, which is sort of like a rebound test, right? So if you have pain in the right side, when you do this, in the, when you're pressing in the left side, then that's a uh, positive test. So you're basically testing for rebound tenderness in the left side of the lower abdomen. And when you press in on the left side and there's no pain, and then all of a sudden you let go and they're saying, oh yeah, it hurts, but it hurts over in the right side, then that's a positive Rovzings and could indicate appendic appendicitis or peritonitis. Uh, the other couple, there's other, uh, there are a couple other signs that can indicate peritonitis or appendicitis. One of them is the psoas sign and this is assessed when the patient is lying down you put their your hand on the patient's thigh above their knee their right knee and ask them to raise their thigh against your hand and if there's pain in the right quadrant the right abdomen this is a positive psoas sign and this is because the um, those muscles all uh, tie in kind of to that right area so if there's inflammation or, or in the right quadrant then it can be exacerbated by having activating the muscles surrounding that area. Um, the obturator sign is another similar um, uh, test for appendicitis or peritonitis. The patient's laying down, they f um, the patient's thigh is flexed, and then you internally rotate the hip, um, and that can sometimes cause pain in the right quadrant. Um, and if it does, then that can indicate a peritonitis or appendicitis. Again, activating those muscles that are kind of tied into that area. Okay, so now that we've discussed uh, how to do the abdominal examination, let's put it into context of some of the common abdominal conditions. Uh, and although this class doesn't focus on diagnosis and treatment, you should know what physical exam findings could indicate. So with a patient with appendicitis, usually they come in, the history is going to be, you know, acute abdominal pain that's worse with movement. You know, sometimes we just have people jump up and down. If they can jump up and down, then they probably don't have peritonitis. 
because you're good there's if there's any inflammation they're not going to want to jump up and down and move those abdominal contents because it's going to be too painful um, so with appendicitis usually the pain will start in the mid abdomen and then later localizes to that right lower quadrant it's associated with fever sometimes definitely usually with anorexia so of all of these symptoms nausea vomiting fever the most common one that's seen is anorexia. So if, if the patient's in the exam room saying, you know, I have, I have pain in my right lower quadrant uh, and you're concerned for appendicitis, if, if they say, oh, I'm starving, you know, if you hear them on the phone saying, hey, mom, I'm starving, can you stop by McDonald's on your way here or something, you know, then they probably don't have appendicitis. If they can eat, if they have hunger, if they're feeling, uh, then, um, then they aren't likely to have appendicitis. Usually appendicitis occurs in younger people um, in that, you know, 11 to 17 year old range. It can um, occur in uh, early adulthood, uh, hood, early adulthood as well. And I've actually even seen it in some 70 year olds, but, um, but most commonly in the early teens. On examination, you'll, um, you could find diminished bowel sounds, right side greater than left side. You'll have right-sided uh, abdominal tenderness, um, so a positive McBurney sign. You'll have positive rebound tenderness. You could potentially have a positive Robsing, so as an obturator sign as well. The sensitivity and specificity for these isn't great, um, and I don't even do them. I, if I was concerned about appendicitis, I would do a Robsing's for you know, the rebound tenderness, the McBurney sign, and then see if they can cough, jump, things like that that are going to change the abdominal contents might do them out of curiosity. I think I have in the past, but routinely if I'm if I'm concerned about that, I don't I don't test a, so as an obturator, but you do need to be aware of them of those tests. This is the location of the appendix of the appendix, they're the most common anatomical location. So here's your ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine, and then here's your umbilicus. So one third the distance is going to be this point right here. Diverticulitis is another common condition. Usually this is going to be older people, age greater than 50. I have seen this in 30 and 40 year old people, usually men more than female, um, who have low fiber diets. They tend to be uh, associated with low fiber diets, um, a lot of bloating and constipation and a lot of abdominal pain. They can sometimes have fever, especially if, the, um, if it's become infectious. They can have uh, pain, and it can be localized anywhere. The most common areas are going to be the left quadrant, the left lower quadrant, um, which is the most common area for diverticulosis. But you've seen, you know, di I've seen diverticulosis or the pockets, the diverticular pockets throughout the um, throughout the GI tract, um, and then rebound tenderness and guarding in that lower uh, quadrant. So here's the most common, but again, you can see it up in here and here and here and can be generalized and, and cause a lot of discomfort. Cholecystitis, usually there, there will be a history of previous biliary pain. It's really, really intense. These people are very uncomfortable. It usually lasts greater than 30 minutes. It's worse after eating fatty meals. Um, uh, it's associated with you know, anorexia can, can be associated with right shoulder pain, nausea, fever. People come in thinking, you know, people come into the ER thinking they're having a heart attack with, with um, cholecystitis because it's that shoulder, you know, shoulder type pain. Um, on examination, they can have obviously abdominal pain, a positive Murphy's sign is the other thing. Pancreatitis, uh, common history findings. They may have a history of alcohol use. They may have a history of gallstones. Um, they might have hypertriglyceridemia, so their um, triglycerides might be elevated, and then um, uh, certain medications as well. So uh, they can be really, they can be really um, uncomfortable as well. So uh, these are the people that even thinking about eating can cause their pancreas to stimulate, you know, the the beta cell production, all that stuff. So they can. They're very, very um, nauseous, and they don't want to even think about food. Usually the pain is mid-epigastric, can radiate to the back. It's worse with movement. Um, and then on exam, they um, have a lot of abdominal discomfort. So when you're palpating, it's going to be really uncomfortable. Uh, a lot of times these people are hypovolemic, which can cause them to be tachycardic and um, and 
have all those sort of, you know, potentially low blood pressure. Usually these people need to be admitted for uh, IV hydration and pain management. This is the most common location for pancreatitis. I've had a lot of people come in for pancreatitis. Even people, you know, um, in their, when I was in college, I've had friends that have had pancreatitis from just drinking binges. Um, so it's really associated with, it can be highly associated with alcohol use and overuse, misuse, um, as well as those people who have had gallbladder um, issues that have caused, caused some gallstones. A note about the pediatric abdomen, um, the abdomen is usually round, uh, it's soft, it's dome shaped, so it kind of has that sort of protuberant look to it. The abdomen and the chest movements are synchronous during respirations for kids, so you don't get that paradoxical thing. Everything should rise together and fall together. If it's an infant, the cord stump uh, should be thick and clean, and again, hernias are really, really, really common. Some other things with kids, the pyloric stenosis. This is um, often a board question, board review question, and it's that olive size mass um, and that causes projectile vomiting. So uh, this is when this pyloric sphincter down at the end of the esophagus before you get into the uh, stomach, you can get a, um, that area gets to stenotic and can kind of thicken up and become a, a little bit of a mass there. So you feel that olive size mass and then the child will have exorcism type projectile vomiting. I mean, it will fly feet, multiple feet. Um, they, again, have the pot belly kind of abdomen contents that, that's um, protuberant abdomen. And then their respirations are, tend to be abdominal uh, until they're five-ish. This is seven, but usually by five, they're, they're chest. They're mainly more from their chest, not their abdomen. Um, in pregnancy, some of the common things that you'll see, um, obviously you'll see a lot of complaints of nausea and vomiting during the first trimester. You might see striae, the stretch marks in the linea nigra, um, which is that central line um, that people can get when they're pregnant, that women can get when they're pregnant on their abdomen. You can um, hear diminished bowel sounds, usually due to, one, decreased peristalsis, but also just large, you know, there's there's something in the way there. You know, there's other structures in the way that the uterus is getting enlarged and uh, you're hearing more of, you know, that's displacing some of the sounds. A lot of constipations and hemorrhoids and things like that um, occur. The uterus generally rises out of the pelvis by about 12 weeks of gestation. So, which is funny because, you know, I've always had, I've had friends who, the you know, the day they're, they find out they're pregnant, they're six or seven or eight weeks along. And all of a sudden they're taking pictures of their bellies and you know, and they're and they're like, oh, you know, look at the baby. You know, here I am at six weeks or seven weeks, and their belly is already sort of distended. I'm like, you know, no, the uterus, the uterus doesn't even rise out of the pelvis by your know, 10, 12, 14 weeks of gestation. Um, ha about 20 to 26 weeks, you can feel some of the uterine contractions potentially. Um, you might see them, you might palpate them, and, and feel them during the examination. Uh, when with older adults, with uh, our elderly folks and older adults, the abdominal wall becomes thinner. The fat de um, deposits are more common. They lose a lot of their muscle tone, and they have de decreased intestinal motility, which can it slows down their motility, can slow down um, um, their peristalsis and cause constipation. And then also be aware that the increased cancers, GI cancers with age, so gastric cancer, colon cancer. All those increase significantly with age. So um, if someone comes in complaining of reflux disease that's just not improved with, you've tried everything, you know, you've tr you started them on Tums, that didn't help. Then you went to your proton pump inhibitors, that didn't help. You know, and, you're, and you've maximized your proton pump inhibitors and nothing's helping, be concerned for potential um, cancers in these, in these folks. All right, a couple slides about the renal assessment. Um, the... Kidneys, this is a, a view, this is a posterior view of the kidneys, um, and kidneys are posterior organs, so they're, they're retroperitoneal organs, so they're more in the back than they are in the front, right? Um, the ribs, those lower ribs, the, the 12th and 11th ribs sort of protect the upper poles of the kidneys. The costovertebral angle, um, which is that angle formed by the lower border of the 12th rib and the transverse process of the um, lumbar vertebra here, 
this is the general region region to assess for kidneys. So this is that region that, you know, if someone comes in for a urinary tract infection and you want to make sure it hasn't progressed to pyelonephritis or a kidney infection, you lightly palpate this area, the CVA. And we call that CVA tenderness, right? Because this is the location of the kidneys. Um, you know, the kidneys are, remember, remember retroperitoneal, so they're more towards the back than the front. So you assess the system when someone complains of urinary tract infection type symptoms, such as dysuria, urinary, uh, urgency, frequency, hesitancy. Um, men with um, benign prostatic hypertrophy might, might complain of decreased stream. They might complain of polyuria, nocturia, getting up you know, multiple times at night to pee. They might, um, you know, other reasons to assess incontinence or, or blood in the urine, hematuria, flank pain, so kidney pain. And then also with hypertension, you know, that renal, renal artery stenosis, the hypertension in a young, otherwise healthy person. So uh, when you are palpating the kidneys, you want to lift up from the 12th rib and try to displace that kid, kidney anteriorly. So you're pressing up with your backhand, and then you're pressing deeply into the quadrant with your um, upper hand. So here's a picture of it. So with your non-dominant hand, you're pressing up with this hand. And then you're pressing down, trying to palpate or blot that kidney. You don't want to capture the kidney. It would be very, it'll be really uncomfortable to capture the kidney. Similar to like an ovary when you're doing the bimanual examination on a female, you don't want to trap the ovary because it can be really uncomfortable. Same with the kidney. You don't want to trap it. You don't want to press too hard on it. You just want to try to, you know, uh, move your hands around here and blot it and try to see if you can um, get an assessment for how uh, where it's located and how large it feels, and and it will be potentially tender um, if you are palpating too hard and and you do feel the kidney. Um, the CVA tenderness again, we talked about that. It's uh, for kidney pain um, or for urinary tract infection that you are concerned about might have migrated from the bladder up the ureters into the kidneys. Uh, and become more of a pyelonephritis or a kidney infection at that point. So you have the patient sitting, you put your hand over the vertebral angle, and then you lightly tap or pound on your hand over the CVA. So here's a picture of that. So you're protecting the area with your hand, and then you're lightly pounding. I hate to use the word pound because I don't want anybody pounding on anybody's um, costal vertebral angles, but you lightly tap or you know lightly pound that area over your hand. If it is positive, the patient will let you know. I mean, the, they will, they'll be very uncomfortable if there's tenderness here. Okay, and that's it for the GI and um, kidney examination. And we'll practice this in lab uh, again. So make sure you to watch your skills videos, and we'll see you guys in lab.